Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jean Vaccaro, and I'm happy to welcome you to this weird format when broadcasting to you live from my living room in Los Angeles. Um, making my Murphy Brown dreams come true. Um, so today's program is part of the One Archives at USC Libraries new online uh, formatting. We're here on Earth Day for a very special reading with poets Raquel Gutierrez and Soretta Morgan, who are going to help us to think through ecological crisis and possibility in this pandemic. Um, Raquel is, I realized Raquel that we've known each other for 17 years, which is totally um, wild. And Soretta is um, a new friend who feels like an old friend. So it's really a pleasure to have um, them here and to have all of you here, although we can't see you, we certainly um, feel you. Um, so as we were kind of thinking about how to approach this particular Earth Day and um, this moment where we're seeing, maybe some of you saw my little memes at the beginning, this idea that the Earth is healing or all these kind of um, fantasies of human sovereignty and questions around eco-fascism. Um, we have been sort of confronted with the ongoing um, dismantling of environmental regulations, of colonial profit, of um, and the uh, extraction of indigenous land, of the detention of human life, and it's kind of questions around who is disposable, what forms of life are disposable. So I was really excited to have a chance to think with Raquel and Soretta and for them to share their work with us today. Um, I invite you to find, find them wherever else you may be able to. I'm going to um, introduce them both now and then Raquel is going to read and Soretta is going to read. And for anybody who would like to um, chat with us or ask a question, you may do so in the chat and we will come back after the reading um, and, and talk with you how, however best we can here. Um, so Raquel Gutierrez was born and raised in Los Angeles and currently lives in Tucson, Arizona, where they just completed two MFAs in poetry and nonfiction um, from the University of Arizona. Raquel is a 2017 recipient of the Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant, and Raquel also runs the Tiny Press Econo Textual Objects, established in 2014, which publishes intimate works by QTPOC poets. Raquel's first book of prose, Brown Neon, will be published by Coffee House Press in the spring of 20. Uh, 21. And Soretta Morgan is a writer and artist. She lives in Phoenix, Arizona, where she teaches creative writing at Arizona State University and contributes to the humanitarian efforts of No More Deaths Phoenix. She's the author of the chat books, Room for a Counter Interior and Feeling Upon Arrival. Currently, her work addresses Black migration to the United, South, United States Southwest and its relationship to contemporary migration and border politics. Soretta holds degrees in writing from Columbia University and Pratt Institute. She is at work on Alt Nature, her first full-length collection. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Raquel. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Jean. And so nice to see or to, to, to sense uh, so many friends in the collective ethers. So I'm going to share my screen and begin with a um, some lyrical piece, section from an essay called The Migrant Stream of Blue Barrels. And this is <clears throat> an homage to No More Deaths in Tucson. Let's see. Okay, so we can see the, uh, see my screen okay? Fantastic. <clears throat> Do migrants dream of healing elixirs, photosynthesized with the cancerous UV rays of the sun? Do they spot the plastic gallon bottles situated at the base of the opetillos that obscure vultures and other carry-on birds perched in wait? I go to Arivaca for lunch with A, one late winter day. A is a good friend of mine who works with no more deaths. Another gender weirdo who's been this close to being charged with a felony for transport of migrants. Through A, I meet other queers who I may have spotted from punk shows in Oakland or Los Angeles or standing in line at the co-op in Brooklyn. 
Many an anarchist punk has made their way to Tucson to work for No More Deaths. So much that No More Deaths feels like some kind of queer rite of passage into Tucson's radical communities, where any given Friday night there'll be a wild mesh and day glow, Bay Area style dance party, fundraiser for undocumented queer and trans people, or bail funds specifically for organizers caught in the crosshairs of draconian border policy. I love Abe's tales of hooking up with fellow aid workers that came through town for the summers only. Sex and no more deaths had a very Platonian quality. The intensity of the work that took place there inspired a most unique eros. It was still quiet on the shore of the Arivaca Lake. Scott Warren hadn't yet been arrested for bringing provisions to migrants stuck in the safe house. when A and I stop at La Gitana Cantina for a quick cold beer. No More Deaths was a necessary revolution, much to the chagrin of Arizona's conservatives. What was the alternative to letting people die in the desert? A picks me up in their dusty decade old dual cab Toyota two door truck. We stop at the co-op in Tucson for all of anchovies, crackers, and kombucha before jumping onto the highway and through the mountain roads that spit us out three miles from the border itself. The town is Wild West Tiny with a general store and a saloon jumping colorfully into my sight line. It's too early for a round at La Gitana Cantina, but that doesn't stop the parking lot from being packed at 11 a.m. A parks in front of the Arivaca Humanitarian Aid Office to introduce me to the aid worker, whose name remains anonymous, who welcomes me in and speaks to me in a familiar Spanish, narrating a day in the life that feels absurd after seeing every other car be a border patrol truck. I'm wondering who might be eyeballing A. I buy a t-shirt. I take a few photos of the people helping people border zone murals that portray a Disney-esque pastoral landscape with desert wildlife hiding behind traffic cones and stop signs. Get your peak. And so in, you know, thinking about our time together here in the Zoom room, Earth Day, and thinking about the mode of relational connection via Zoom. Um, I, and, you know, I'm thinking about the last uh, two, three years of road trips um, to and fro the Southwest through <clears throat> three deserts, uh, Desert Basin, and the Airbnbs that uh, ended up being my anchor points in some of these travels. So this one's called Mindless, Mindless Scroll for Joshua Tree. This is a poem. I take umbrage with the contagion of precarity. This was supposed to be our life, where the clouds in my coughing meant another mundane coyote trick. Now magic panics, new dogma, a star-crossed pattern, hatched in shambles across an unaffordable sky. Hovering above every winter desert getaway lies a minimalism to accrue insulin and sell it back to the yellow, white, red, and black. Every four directions, got an Airbnb for you and me, I hot tub under the Geminids. For those and these are the mythological stripes of the libertarian hinterland. Joshua Tree, hashtag, large white framing captures a flag. I get the dopamine back upon waking a Uranus opposition. I am the desert excess in found object austerity. I refuse door to door to wish away the poor. Here self-deception believes the lie. Here the moon song dream stutter washes over jumbo rocks until it disappears. Lips wrapped around me as a sun rocket cheers inside another paranoia, pale blue pyre. Here come the ancient good times where I get pulled over a passport and over-harvested sage bundle sends me on my way. You probably think Old Woman Springs Road is about you. 
the cool new lack, the acceptable poppers shake the tree, the paycheck to payback, the aging hipster economy invite me to parties and let me quarantine against manifest destiny's child. I might cut this pack of tricksters when they try to take my dog and call it divination for the supper state. This one's called Thirst Trap in the Gloaming, where mountains in silhouette pat down, a discount barber school cut along a pink neon line, tracing its finger down muscle, taut terrain in formation, a bothersome cavalcade of ranges named after saints. How lonely I was hiding on election night. The darker it gets outside and the interior is closing in on me. Tomorrow, an unknown internment. Electric blue music video like a greedy motherfucker still too proud to eat or consult urban lexicons while I Instagram every movement like stations of the cross. For the full moon promise of staying young, getting laid, a reluctant human sacrifice, bong watered into fruition by the time another cycle completes. The night is purpling into apology now. Where there will be lumpy tissue, my God. The good choices are getting harder to decipher, easier to fall into the same bullshit crocodile. There will be eczema intuiting over and over, scratching into soil, and man in 2525 won't be here under this blazing mystical light waning a hot pre-truth serum, but in the meantime, to ward off the bad winds and all that is to come here without you, I write my book, Angel. It's called Puro Deseo. I want to be lit. I want to stay humble, but I'm a mountain afraid to lose its place in the landscape. I wanna give these lands back, but I don't know how. Inhale comfort into these contested terrains, answer for a question unimaginable. I had a dream that Jose Munoz showed up wearing a wine town plaid sky, a blue windbreaker, hides a smiling bulldog, silver lined alebrije, who waits alongside the rest of me to see how the light falls over this tenuous hole of Aslan. Is this how you imagine him? I wonder, as he tells me, looking up at Pikachu Peak, you should always be with the people you love the most. I wake and want to be moved towards you suddenly, a social evolution, a maturity is offering, a needle falls off a choya as an opotillo passes judgment in this tiny desert town. While these trails where I temper a performative nature, I move like a 45 record to groove, Slither the erasures. I'm responsible for in these discursive fantasies, the pages dog-eared, well-worn and masculine. I want to give these lands back, but I don't know how. So I obviously picked all the poems that had the word quarantine in them for the moment. This one's called Corona. And I, this is not a new poem. I wrote this a couple years ago. This is not a new poem, Corona. And then there's the drive back to Tucson just before Picacho heralds the last remaining 40 miles to my bedroom. Here in the desert, the sand blows. It blows by quicker than 40 days of glory. Nothing is gonna stop me from making it home this time except a message from a friend who marked his illness with a tattoo on his neck, a cancer down in the valley where no one can see unless he pulls his collar eastward in time for a sun rising like anyone can beat back disease. There are other ways to put yourself in quarantine, a fallow field, a miserable wind, and an even worse winter. The red kiss emojis find me when I need them out the window. The changing asks no one for permission. The film strip runs as fast as my foot on the gas pedal allows it to. And in time to welcome the night, it tempers my longing for a sun refusing to take off her crown for me. And this was when I would take road trips. Look how happy I was. Look how soft my skin looked. Look how dewy and young and possible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Raquel.
Thank you. I'm going to find Soretta. Hey, here I am. Hey, Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read some poems. I'm also gonna share some images. Um, so I'm gonna put up the screen share as well. Let's see. Alt Nature, the oldest public record of Black death in the state of Arizona, regards an NI loss to exposure. His skin then found in dry orchards on saguaro picked state of being exposed to contact with something else, even when making very little noise the brutality of thick air and money, mythos and disgust for what is fleshy yet unuseful, of the raw materials necessary to maintain life which may be commodified. Water distinguishes itself through ease of portability. This is true, though on a clear day, it runs easily from one's hand. Along the edge of Pinal County, migrants discard what they no longer need and what might identify them as such. Shoes, the texture of sea anemones, black bottles to hold water without reflecting light. Someone placed a child's weathered skull at the base of a cairn in order to be seen. During the classical period, Hohokam peoples traveled land between our 40th and 23rd prime meridians, though these distinctions weren't adopted until 1855. Between what is Utah and Mexico, their trailheads thread what has been expelled from the current moment through language. Chain choya fruit and fall. The soil softens, saturated according to rain. A moment extends as far as allowed, as does a story or a river undammed. Each day, the earth begins in England and crawls its shadow west, a term used to color forms and people even in the dead of morning, as chest warm underwater before facing light. Light first enters the Sonoran Desert, it's in the northern gulf, where life includes endangered horned lizards that can fit in the palm of one's hand. Once plentiful in North America, the species is threatened through predation by domestic dogs and the displacement of compatible prey. Among known understandings of natural life in the United States is the sentence, as in, for the rest of one's natural life, which unlike the sentence of life does not imply or otherwise allow for the possibility of parole, which was anyway discontinued within Arizona in 1993 when the possibility of parole was replaced with a process which remains judicially vague. Today, due to imprecise and or language during hearings that occurred after 1994, hundreds of people serve time toward parole hearings exist. Insofar as a sentence is a set of words complete self, every sentence holds its conclusion, its unique termination of a period of time Soft purple signals the end of night in southern Arizona, against which cliffed mountains silhouette into view. Tree frogs retreat in the depths of winter. Their bodies appear lifeless, as do gall moths, 
avoid internal freezing by emptying their guts. Passed on May, May 2nd, House Bill 2570, establishment of a committee to address the decades long epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women in the state of Arizona. Among the many indigenous women overlooking the Senate floor, Debbie Nez Manuel stood alongside her daughters holding a photo of her mom gone missing in 1973. Debbie was three, a child in Clagato, Arizona. Its caretakers, the land is known as Lito, water underneath. Her home built over a map of silent streams, the namesake still full of dark water, though in disrepair. The rest flow at geologic time in and out of view. Ability to enact time as a verb rests on particular understandings of the noun, the flesh and rock. Unlike most of the state, some Navajo Nation, some of Navajo Nation does observe daylight savings. In 1973, the sun fell over and back the roof of St. Anne's Mission, illuminating the rectory and each of its tokens welcoming light from the east. Francis Senage was found and buried that same year. At the height of the San, Franc San Francisco mountains, there are years in the environment and sea water, thus rate wagwort and patient earth, yellow beneath boulders forming brittle mats. Bristlecone, our oldest living relatives, molded by ice, their branches disfigure each morning's sky. At the lower slopes, recycled sewage blasts onto the mountain face. Treated with bacteria and ultraviolet light, a palmful is almost drinkable. Sweet, pleasant for skiing. Untested for flushed medications, though if present, their concentrations would be triflingly low. Schedule for autoimmune support, menstrual relief, enzyme disruptors can change the character of an herb. In Locket Meadow, Aspen Root, where over 200,000 years ago, eruption blew out from the volcano side. Rodilio Rodanta, cluster along tundra. The faithful congregate regardless. In what water doesn't take time concentrates, which is foundational to Denver chronology to trace variations on the fibers and rings. Lonely, the pearl-shelled interiors of marine gastropods erode in volcanic cones, 500 miles from the sea. If there was a question with regard to desecration, the abalone longing in their silken way. Having been struck by lightning near Las Cinegas, from which water flows north, eventually joining the Santa Cruz, a man then unidentified and fully flushed, condition code one, heard moving through the desert, thunder swaying Sacaton, his probable electrocution mapped into a database of migrant death are crossed infrequently by desert jaguars fond of streams. At 51 feet below surface, shallow, yet enough to support vast riparian species, the Belviero, whose chittery call is identified by a two-part structure, his, his definitive response, breast. Intense lightning can bloom a tree and flush, however, catches fire quite slowly, peeling first the epidermis for minutes at a time. Next, the dermis breaks to release capillaries and fat, though often asphyxiation has already occurred. Riparian species mark the meeting of water and land, where cottonwoods, extending their gold-filtered crowns, optimize light, stratify sediments, and keep stream-dwelling species cool. So is that the lowland leopard frog will not blister. So is that the large cat's paw print remains fresh in the soil. I haven't done enough, and what I've offered has been with fear. At some point, it won't matter. 
I have a brother, I say, if a woman asks why I come east on the I-10 Phoenix toward Tucson, the interstate that South Peak appears to migrate. Upon arrival, I demanded my name. A desert iguana abandoned her pearl back. The door unlatches and there's another two industrial fine interrogations. He wrote that he was cold, particularly at night. Everything was expensive. A watermelon seed sprouted outside of the shower and for days everyone watched until an officer noticed. He needed money for a sweater. He was growing thin. It was very hard to sleep. My lover, she says, in the afterlife, there are everywhere watermelons. You pick one, another grows. I say that sounds like nigga heaven and I laugh. I just want love. I just want to feel love, he says, flushed with desire. The bartender, the social worker, his supervisor, his girlfriend, tell him it's time to go. He won't stop cursing, so I hang up the phone. He flew into the air when the truck hit him. I told myself, tuck and roll, nigga, tuck and roll. So he walked away with no injuries. But that night when I came, fear staggering down the highway braided itself into my orgasm. Outside of Joshua Tree National Park, esteemed for unpolluted night skies, I met a sculptor from Pittsburgh. We were at the dog run and hers was humping. She remarked that everything in this desert was dead or being hunted. After several minutes, which can be months really in dog park years, I offered that the inability to recognize life outside of the scale and terms with which one is accustomed is a serious problem in this country. And the call. One medicine helped him to mania which is the problem with misdiagnoses, which is the problem with incompetence and general disregard. His body fractured again and again, unreachable through coexisting boundaries, vocabulary, vulnerability, and scale. My refusal to regard is a measure of defense and requires constant attention, slip under our bushes in through the the brood picked off one by one or two. The shelter provided to those who demonstrate signs of serves a name with that which is provided to those who can demonstrate relevant and imminent threat, depending on the kind. Welcome to this country, he said, my brother. I can't touch the vantage from which he offers these introductions, though I imagine a light that visits free living animals as they sleep but in nocturnes and fresh turned smell. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Soretta. Thank you, Raquel. I'm going to ask both of you to unmute. And Soretta, um, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> hi. I'm only muting my video when I take a sip of beer. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to share some questions from the chat, if that's okay. Um, the first one comes from our friend Sarah Kessler, who has a, who was curious about the relationship of images that were accompanying the text and asked if each of you might talk a little about your process of writing vis-a-vis -vis these spaces that you're both speaking about. Yeah. Raquel, should I go first? Are you, are you still swallowing? I was burping. <laughs> Um, yeah, please, by all means. <laughs> um, yeah, I think if with regard to this project, um, so the video, that video is about two years old, 
whereas all of the writing is between a year and maybe six months old. And um, the video I made when I first moved to Phoenix and, um, and also it was my first moving to Arizona. And it was kind of um, a way for me to engage with the landscape at a time where I felt like I couldn't enter enough to write about it. Um, I'd been looking through like a lot of archival photos and um, there was one that really kind of that I still go back to. It's called uh, Negro Hauling, Hauling Home Water and it's from Russell Lee's FSA collections. Um, and it's just a black man walking through the streets of Phoenix carrying a cart um, with like, canisters of liquid. And um, so I kind of, I took that like formal um, piece from it and kind of reproduced them and then took them out to water my own. Um, and it's like, it's a project that I'm still interested in, but like when like put against the writing, I think there's something about that video project that um, it's very much about my own individual um, relationship to land and reconciliation and healing, um, which I feel is like, it's never enough. You know, like when we think about healing the land and healing communities, like it's um, like, it kind of has to be also about, um, about resources for other people and kind of communal needs. Um, and that's where the text comes from is me thinking about the larger project of a reconciliation with the earth. Um, you know, I, uh, I've been teaching this queer sex class and um, which is, has been an opportunity to introduce the documentary Wildness by Wu Sang uh, to my students who, um, you know, the, the documentary came out in 2012 and it is a document to the year in the life of a underground, a, um, an everyday nightlife that took place in Figo Union in downtown Los Angeles uh, around the convergence of several publics at a space called Silver Platter. And Wildness being the sort of the art school club, art school kid club that happened on Tuesday nights where you have a uh, trans-Latina immigrant folk, people in the neighborhood um, have these uh, uh, moments, these uh, chance encounters with the um, sort of differently legibly privileged members of a uh, bohemian class in, uh, in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles. And so watching that film has also um, invited us to listen to listen to lectures by Jose Munoz and writings by Jose Munoz on the documentary Wildness, which was one of his last uh, um, readings, very critical readings of uh, queer cultural production. And so listening to the oral lecture, there was a moment where um, Jose rehearses this idea of the commons emerging in the space of nature. And so for me that, um, kind of, you know, uh, shocked everything into um, this new understanding of, of, of the desert, of, um, of open space, of the, of the landscape, of nature, the natural world, as a, as a site, you know, as a space of contention for, uh, for brown, black, red um, communities and needing to understand the ways in which history animates these landscapes and the ways in which these landscapes are also receptacles for uh, mysteries of, of desire and, and colonization um, and feeling like those convergences have been in some way what's um, animated my own thinking and, and, and work. So, um, you know, of course, being taken with the uh, sort of the, the, the sensory information that is being caught in the uh, in, in the largesse of uh, majesty of nature, right? Just like a, a desert sunset, even seeing like a full moon rise in Joshua Tree, um, you know, on the same night as a, as a meteor shower, as, a, as the moon is rising, you hear people in 
in the distance, just be like, yeah, woo, yeah, because the sun is, because the moon is rising and it's incredible. And um, it gets um, to this moment where we're all uh, indulging in this collective howl, right? Anyway, so um, I feel like my, my work is, you know, a convergence uh, around that. Thank you so much. We have lots of other questions about space and landscape. Um, so Soretta, just a quick question, but because there was a little bit of audio like fizzling. Um, we missed the first recorded Black Death in Arizona. Oh, it's... Um, name? The record is, the person doesn't have a na name, they're unidentified, but the cause of death is exposure. Mm. Thank you. Um, so I'm just thinking, Raquel, about what you're, I'm remembering watching Jose's, um, the video of him speaking in Tucson about wildness and his kind of invocation of brownness as like flora and fauna and mi minerals and enclosures and kind of forms of forms and shapes of resistance in relationship to the landscape. Um, thank you for sharing that work. Um, there's a question for you about what draws, Raquel, what draws you to deserts over and over again. Um, Taya says, I'm taken by the way your writing works to recover life in these places that are frequently imagined as empty or dead spaces. Um, you know, the, the long, it's, it's, I don't know, sometimes I think about how I got here and it starts with um, a series of divinatory readings that I received from a really wonderful Los Angeles based artist, Asher Hartman, who um, does, uh, uh, he's like our queer Sam Beckett, um, but better. And, but he's also a psychic and I've been seeing him for 10 years and he sits and sits with you and, and uh, you know, reads my chakras and, and narrates the images, the symbols that emerge as a way for me to understand aspects of myself. And in some ways, you know, I take this to be a mode of recovering a personal history without having to traumatize anyone in, in the familial archive to narrate these traumas and a way to divine a history. And, to, and to, as a poet, you know, the, the image reigns supreme. And so these readings are a treasure trove of images and I'm able to divine particular historical leanings, um, gestures, provocations in such a way that um, being in the desert just uh, amplifies those communications. Um, also, you know, these meetings with Asher, he's been, he's been seeing the Sonoran Desert in my, in my symbols and my chakras for far longer than I've been here, so um, it it does it feels energetically uh, fraught, just narrating that sort of like uh, that genesis, you know, to to my being here. But it's um, a mode I think that is in um, it helps with that with ab with abstraction, and it helps with not having to rehearse certain traumas or re represent certain traumas in order to, uh, you know, make art, make work, make poems. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share a couple more questions and mm -hmm. a lot of them are obviously kind of interested in questions of location and place. Of course, absolutely. And of course we could tell Raquel, before we, before everyone joined us, we were talking about it being a full moon in Taurus tonight. So we could, it's a new moon. New moon. So we could do a bit of, um, you know, talking about that. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to light my trabajo candle. And um, because of new moon in Taurus, Taurus rules the, uh, the, the, the tangible, the embodied, and nothing's more tangibly embodied than labor and the laboring body. So my trabajo candle is for those who work, the workers. And um, it's also an interesting kind of convergence of, uh, of heavenly bodies. There's um, 
you know, if you follow astrology, there's some powerful squares happening in the sky. And so um, I think the biggest rumble happening gift to Earth Day is that crude oil has lost its value. <laughs> so if we could figure out a way to return it. And, you know, and that's also, you know, some of the things that like come to the fore in, in living in Southern Arizona is just the, the extractive, extractive capital and uh, extractive economies. And um, I think the biggest uh, allure that people have to choose on is the Gem Expo that happens once a year, where, you know, there's a Gem Expo in Munich, Germany, and in Tucson, Arizona, where, you know, mining uh, impresarios come and like sell uh, gemstones mined um, in various nefarious ways and sell them to the public. And so you feel like the, the uh, sinister energies sort of like come to the fore. It's like um, the dark crystal South by Southwest. <laughs> so. Um, we have a question from Michelle that I think relates to this, which is about, um, Michelle asked, do you believe a connection to the natural world is intertwined with a connection to the spirit world? I think that you both um, do, but I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about that. Who are you asking? Sorry, can you say that again, Sarda? Who are you asking? Say that once more. Oh, I just asked, were you asking that to me or to Raquel? Um, I'll ask to you. <laughs> um, so there were some questions about the relationship of the natural world to a spirit world, and then also a question about topography imprinting itself in the diction of the work. And so Ryan asks, how much of the process was reanimating a past experience with place and how much of the process was influenced by the location of writing? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know right now how to connect those two questions off the top of my head. Um, the first one in terms of spirit world and physical world. Um, I think what, like to go back to the moon cycle, um, you know, right now I am like trying to speak with my uh, paternal grandmother who passed away when I was 16. And um, we have a lot of the same um, chart. And um, so like the, the moons have been kind of like prompts for me to talk to her in different ways. And um, and then also, I think in terms of uh, this, the natural world, you know, I have my own ways of trying to communicate and divine. And um, I think listening to the natural world has, natural world, um, has been, um, has been like, an exercise for me to listen to how she might be talking back. So, you know, I'm interested in crystals and pendulums, but she, you know, being a farmer um, and Pentecostal um, preacher's wife is not so interested in those things. And so, um, you know, for her, I look at the moon, I listen for crickets, I, um, I watch fire and just, um, yeah, so just like trusting that she's there and that these are the tools that she has to speak with me. Um, yeah, and now I can't remember the other question, though I remember that it was interesting. It was. <laughs> um, it was a question from Ryan who says, thinking of location and place as the moment of our interaction with, geog with geography, I can hear the topography imprint itself in the diction how much of the process was reanimating a past experience with place and how much of the process was influenced by the location of writing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I often, uh, when I have those moments of recognition in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the material world, the, the, the unencumbered, non-impacted by a modernity world, natural world, um, you know, there are, there are, I think, signatures of, um, you know, ancestral signatures that, that come and I ref I've, ref you know, I've taken note and some of those notes appear in, in some of my poems. And um, I, I often think of those as the ancestral seizure or, you know, to be seized 
by the by the ancestral uh, anima, the energy. And um, so, and I think it's for me, you know, I um, have only, I've only been in Tucson uh, three and a half uh, years or four years in August. And I came here for an MFA and I knew I was gonna stay here just because um, it was just, it just, my, my head quieted down, you know, I just could hear things, listen to things. Um, but I'm from, you know, I, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles and up until moving to Tucson, even when I lived in the Bay Area, I was a Los Angeles nationalist, you know, so, and, and uh, Angeleño uh, to my detriment. So, um, but I've never really uh, received those or been uh, able to capture those ancestors or be cap captured by those ancestral seizures until I arrived in Tucson. I don't know why. I want to speak to that question about location. Um, I moved to Arizona from um, New York and uh, before I moved here, I'd always lived on the East Coast and um, you know, my family's from the American South and, you know, I grew up in the kind of New York, DC, Virginia, um, a little bit in Kentucky and um, conversations about blackness are very like, canonized there, very canonized and very, um, the black Atlantic is kind of central to all of it. Um, and so like moving out here, I had to think about, um, like the, almost like the role of blackness here and how it manifests and how I manifest it. And um, like the questions because of this location are very different. Um, and so it's something that I became really interested in was um, like post, um, post um, Jim Crow or like post reconstruction, like, um, towards the end of Jim Crow, like black people moving to the Southwest. And, you know, at that time when as a national project, kind of black people were deciding what it meant to be free and a citizen in the United States. And so like, how do those questions shift? And those kind of um, like the structures around them in terms of like churches and farming and land ownership and access to education you know, how do those questions shift in relationship to the desert here and, you know, like near the US-Mexico border and in really, really explicit relationship to indigenous dispossession and um, extraction um, in a way that was, I think, more hidden and it's easier to not talk about um, when, when people are na um, narrating Black experience on the um, East Coast. Thanks, Zaretta. Um, I think maybe we'll do is have one final question to close out. And it's from your friend, Ariel Goldberg, who uh, says, did I hear right that, I'm not sure how to say this, Picacho Peak, that funky mountain between Tucson and Phoenix's highway appeared in both your readings. What was it like to hear this similar place you are both in reflected in each other's work? Mm -hmm. Pikachu Peak. Um, Pikachu Peak. Well, the thing, you know, for me, Pikachu Peak will always be that um, visual marker that I'm coming up onto Tucson. Um, or if I'm leaving Tucson and I see it, I know I'm, I don't know, Pikachu Peak. Um, I don't know if I have a cool answer. I think I like the alliter alliterative, alliterative um, element, um, the road trippiness. Mm. I mean, I you know I appreciate uh, Soretta's work as just um, echoes to um, Black critical witnessing to uh, to Arizona to Phoenix, which is really distinct from Southern Arizona. And, um, and, you know, when I understand um, 
you know, the thing about the air base, the military bases here, right? That's what brings uh, or what's brought uh, black communities to Arizona as the military and feeling like those are my histories that, um, I mean, Tisa Bryant uh, always reminds me that she was born in Tucson on the Air Force Base. And uh, I always think about, um, or even just um, the, uh, in El Paso, the, mil the presence of military and especially the, the young black men who um, came to a lot of uh, aid in, during the, um, the Walmart shootout. I always think about just like, oh man, the military bases and the ways in which our, our communities um, uh, encounter one another, right? So, mm -hmm. because of, I don't know. I, don't, I think it's, it's great. It, it's a great echo in Strata's work. Um, it just makes me think more about the ways our um, sort of poetic, critical witnessing as, mm, you know, I'm thinking about like, oh, am I, am I an outsider? You know, just as an Angelino, as someone from LA, uh, but also someone who wants to treat Tucson as sort of the central point um, in the Southwest, where for me it's uh, um, Brownsville to San Francisco. Yeah, I think so. For me, Picasso Peak is like, um, so I, I visit the detention center in Eloy, Arizona, which is about halfway between um, Phoenix and Tucson. And I, I started to realize that I knew, it's like an hour, a little bit over an hour drive. And I started to realize um, when I was getting close, because of the place where, like, it was almost time to get off the interstate based on where that mountain was. And that was a very, like, interesting moment for me and almost, like, encouraging moment for me that, like, um, that my understanding of the land was, um, was coming through, like, the social, like, the social justice practice. Um, and that was something that I really appreciated. And I think um, when I think about Raquel's work, like I'm, I like when you first, when you said that in your poem, I was like, oh, like it felt like just another point of connection because I think we're also kind of dealing with relationships of land and race and history. Um, and so just that that's um, a physical point um, where our work also meets, um, like felt very nice. Yeah, it's been really wonderful to have the two of you share your work with us and to think about the intersections of your thinking and your writing practices and your imaginative practices. And I wonder if we might find a way to share some examples of your work that you read today and some of the images on this list of people that are, I guess, read on this weird platform. Um, I'm so grateful to both of you for this um, really nice moon and Earth Day experience. And there will be more kind of things like this coming from the One Archives at USC Library. So I hope people will keep following along and um, lots of love to both of you and to all the people who came and listened and shared faster. Thank you, Jean Vaccaro. <laughs> Thank you, Soretta Morgan. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, it was wonderful. It's lovely to spend the hour with you all. Yeah, same. Good night, everybody. Take care.